President, I see our, uh, the majority leader and the minority leader are on the floor, at, and I will uh, turn the floor back to the esteemed senator from South Carolina. And thank uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator from South Carolina. I'll turn this over. Can I have just two minutes to wrap up? <laughs> uh, I want to thank Senator Reed and Senator from McConnell for scheduling this vote. Eighty-two senators stand behind President Obama's statement that it's bad policy to contain a nuclear-capable Iran. And let me tell you right quickly why. If the Iranians get a nuclear weapon or nuclear capability, the Sunni Arab states will want one themselves to counter Shia Persian influence, and you'll have a nuclear arms race in the Mideast. That's not a good thing. That's the road to Armageddon. Israel will never know a minute's peace. If the Ayatollahs in Iran have a nuclear weapon, my God, what would living in Israel be like? Look at the threat you would live under for the rest of your life. That's a no-go for the people of Israel. And the big concern I have, above all else, is that the Ayatollahs will share that nuclear capability, that technology with a terrorist group. And the only reason thousands have died in the war on terror, not millions, they just can't get the weapons to kill millions of us. And if the Ayatollahs had those nuclear weapons or that capability, they'd share it with terrorists. That's why containment is not a good idea. This is not an authorization to use force. It encourages sanctions. It encourages diplomacy. It says all options on the table. It's not authorizing force, but it's taking off the table the idea the Iranians can get a nuclear weapon and we'll try to contain them because that's just emptying Pandora's box. One last thought. An Israeli soldier was killed uh, today because the Sinai border between Egypt and Israel was breached. Part of our aid to Egypt has conditions that says if you break the treaty with Israel, you lose the money and you need to beef up the security in the Sinai. The Egyptian army is basically being driven out of the Sinai. They're moving back in. So if you really do care about the security of Israel, uh, we cannot break relations with Egypt. It is a complicated relationship, but it's in our interest to be involved. And again, we're, we're all over the world in different fashions, and I'd rather be helping people help themselves than having to send soldiers in every time there's a hot spot in the world. Uh, we can't disengage from the world. It's our destiny to be the leader of the free world. We're just to do it, do it smartly. One percent of our budget spent on foreign assistance, I think, makes sense. And with that, I'll uh, yield the floor and thank all of my colleagues for jumping on board for a resolution that I think is timely. And if the Senate of the United States ever needed to speak with one voice on a single topic, it is now, and that single topic is to the Iranian regime, you will not be allowed to get a nuclear weapon, period. With that, I yield the floor. In the last Okay. Mr. President, Majority Leader, I ask you to consent at 11 p.m. this evening. There will be 30 minutes of debate equally divided between the Majority Leader and Senator Paul or their designees. The following to use or yielding back of that time, the Senate proceed to votes in relation to the following items in order listed below. Passage of S3576, passage of SJ Res 41, cloture on HJ Res 117. If cloture is invoked on HJ Res 117, Pending amendments be withdrawn, the Senate proceed to vote on passage H.J. Res. 117. Committee following that vote, the Senate proceed to the cloture vote on the motion to proceed S. 3525. Cloture is not invoked on H.J. Res. 117. The Senate proceed to the cloture vote on the motion to proceed to S. 3525. The vote on passage of S. 3576 be subject to a 60 affirmative vote threshold. If S. 3576 does not achieve 60 affirmed votes, then it will be returned to the calendar. Following the, major the cloture vote on the motion to proceed to S. 3525, the majority leader will be recognized finally that no amendments motion appoints order to be in order during the consideration of these measures. Mr. Sorry, President, I would ask, I would, I would ask, uh, yes, and that, that the, the last paragraph that I read, Mr. President, following the cloture vote on the motion to proceed to S. 3525, I be recognized. Uh, at 11.30, and that, that during the pendency of this matter, there be no amendments, motions, points of order, and order during the consideration of any of these measures. And that's also all, all begins at 11.30. Mr. President, I would also ask that the, usually we have a uh, 15-minute vote for the first one, but I think with, with the time of the, we're doing this, I would like all votes to be 10-minute votes. And I ask consent that be the case. And between each measure, there will be two minutes 
equally divided so these sponsors and those opposing the passage of that legislation can speak on them. Without objection? Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, the uh, agreement paves away from completion of remaining business for the work period. It's going to be a very early morning or late night, however you look at it, but uh, it's the right thing to do. I expect that upon completion of the schedule votes, a motion to proceed to the sports mill would be pending post cloture. I'm gratified that we're on track to attempt to move this measure when we get back. After we address that bill, when we return November, I intend to move to Senator Menendez's housing bill. But I'll be in touch with the Republican leader more times, several times before the election, I'm sure, anyway. Majority Leader. All, everyone should uh, understand that what we're going to try to do this evening, we've spoken with the Republican, I've spoken with the Republican Leader. When people finish their talking, we hope it can be early this evening, we would go into recess. And hopefully we can do that 5, 6 o'clock tonight until 11.30 tonight. I hope that can be done. Senator from Kentucky. We have before us a resolution on containment of Iran. Now, I have voted for sanctions on Iran and don't think it's a good idea that Iran have nuclear weapons. However, I'm very concerned about this particular resolution. I think a vote for this resolution is a vote for the concept of preemptive war. I know of no other way to interpret this resolution. The resolution says that containment, the strategy of trying to prevent expansion or invasion of countries, will never be our policy with regard to Iran. While I think it unwise to announce that we will contain Iran, I do think it unwise to tell Iran, oh, it's fine to get a nuclear weapon, we'll contain you. I also think it's equally unwise to say we will never contain you. The reason I say this is that we woke up one day and Pakistan had nuclear weapons. We woke up one day and Russia had nuclear weapons. China and India and North Korea. Had we made the statement, the rash statement, that we will never contain any country that has nuclear weapons, what does that mean? I think that means that you've decided right now before anything happens, you've decided that you will preemptively go to war. We've been at war for a decade now. We've been at war in Afghanistan, and I supported going to Afghanistan, but I'm ready to come home from Afghanistan. We were at war in Iraq for nearly 10 years. I'm glad we're coming home from Iraq, but I don't want to automatically commit our country to a war in Iran. So while I do think it's a mistake to say we won't contain them, I think it's also a mistake to say that we will contain them. It's a mistake to have a policy that is explicit one way or the other. President Reagan was once criticized and accused of having no foreign policy. He replied that it wasn't that he had no foreign policy, it was that he didn't care to share it with everyone. Because if you give everyone your potential enemies or friends, if you say to every country, if you do X, I'll do X, or if you maybe do this, I'll do that, you're exposing exactly what your plans are, and that may not be the best strategy. In other words, foreign policy is an ever-shifting battleground, and there should be a certain strategic ambiguity to foreign policy. So when we announce to Iran or to the world that we will never, ever contain Iran, it's an announcement that the bombs will be dropping if we ever hear that they are a nuclear power. I don't, think, I don't think we should say automatically we're willing to accept them as a nuclear power, but I don't think we should automatically say that there will be a preemptive war with Iran. 
Now, everybody's been bragging. They say, oh, everybody's in the Senate is for this. Well, everybody's not. I'm not for this. I may be alone on this. But interestingly, if you travel to Israel, there's a very spirited debate on this. Meyer Dagan, who's the head of the Mossad, cares deeply about Israel, would not be by anyone's imagination accused of being a shrinking violet. He's done many things to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. He's worried about what happens the minute the bombs start dropping on Iran. Where do you think the next set of bombs come? They'll be on Tel Aviv. They won't be on the U.S., but if you live in Tel Aviv, you might have some concern over what happens and what does Iran do. The other thing about beginning a war is that historically our country, we have had defensive wars. Nobody messes with us, and I agree with that. You mess with the United States, there will be significant repercussions. We won't let you invade other countries, and we won't let you invade the United States. But the idea that we will have offensive war and not defensive war is a concept that is new in our history. Preemptive war, going to war and saying, we will go to war to prevent you from doing certain activities is a new concept in our lexicon of foreign policy. And I think it's a dangerous one. Announcing to the world, as this resolution does, that containment will never be our policy is unwise. It's a recipe for perpetual war. A country that vows to never contain an enemy is a country that vows to always preemptively attack. To rule out containment as a strategy or as a strategic and sometimes militarily active form of defense is to admit that we have become Orwellian. Yes, we have always been at war with East Asia. Or yes, we have always been at war with Eurasia. It's an idea that we will always be perpetually at war. Now, I'm proud of being for a strong national defense. I'm proud of being for protecting our country. But I cannot accept a resolution that says we will completely get rid of the containment strategy that really was a strategy that kept us safe for 60 years during the most aggressive and dangerous war we've ever encountered, the Cold War. Soviet Union had 30,000 intercontinental ballistic missiles that could reach the United States and attack us and devastate our country. If we would have had this concept that we rule out the idea of containment, we would have had an awful and devastating and maybe cataclysmic war with Russia. Now, North Korea is more similar to Iran, a two-bit dictatorship that has trouble feeding their own people, has trouble having enough supplies of food and gasoline for their own people, there are similarities. But when North Korea announced that they had a nuclear weapon, did we immediately start dropping bombs? Did we say we won't contain them? We contain North Korea. And some would argue that the leadership of North Korea is equally as irrational as the leadership of Iran, if not more so. So we are able to contain a two-bit socialist, very small and unproductive country like North Korea. I see no reason why, if we had to, we couldn't contain Iran. Now, I'm not promoting that as a philosophy. We shouldn't be telling Iran we'll contain you. But for goodness sakes, we shouldn't be saying we will never contain you. The people who vote for this resolution, I think, are well-meaning. But I don't think they're thinking this through. And we've had this before. When the resolution came up for the Iraq war, many voted for it. And then some came back later and say, well, I voted for it before I voted against it. They wanted it both ways. Many come up to me now and say, I voted for the Iraq war, but it was a mistake. I voted for this concept of offensive war, of preemptive war, to stop Iraq from having weapons of mass destruction, but I made a mistake. I think the Iraq war was a mistake. I wasn't here, but I would have voted no. I fear that we're pushing on. Every month there has to be a new and more bellicose resolution to ensure that we will go to war and that at all costs we will go to war in Iran. I think it's a mistake. I think there should be some strategic ambiguity, meaning that you don't announce to your enemies exactly what you're going to do. You let them know firmly what your position is, but you don't announce to them your entire military strategy. To do so, to rule out a strategy that we had for 60 years that worked 
that kept us in a very difficult and uneasy peace with the Soviet Union, does anybody here argue that we would have been much better if containment would not have been a strategy? If we would have said, absolutely to Russia, if you do this, we are going, the bombs will drop tomorrow. That scares me. But what scares me more is that so many members of this body are just jumping up and down to embrace each other in the bipartisan desire that we will not have containment as a strategy, that we absolutely will go to war if we wake up and Iran has nuclear weapons. You know what? The other day, Meyer Dagan, the former head of the Mossad, said that you can't bomb nuclear knowledge out of the psyche. Nuclear knowledge, the knowledge to make nuclear weapons, is out there now, and it's in Iran, and we'll not be able to stop that knowledge. We'll not be able to eradicate the knowledge of nuclear weapons. That's something to think about, because there may come a day, and this is the prelude to the next argument. The next argument we have on this floor will be, one day, when Iran announces, and I'm not for this, I think we should do everything. I voted for sanctions. I think we should do everything to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon. But my goodness, this is a huge mistake. And it, is, it may be unpopular for me at home to say this, but I will say it, and I will say it loudly, to rule out any kind of defensive strategy that doesn't include an offensive war is a huge mistake for the country. And I will vigorously oppose this amendment and I hope that those who have glommed onto this resolution so quickly, because there is an incredible force behind this resolution. There's an incredible lobbying apparatus that says, you've got to go on to this or else. I hope they'll reread this and reconsider. Think about the double and triple amputees that have come home to your town. Think about the soldiers who have committed suicide. Think about the hundreds of thousands of soldiers who are overseas now and ask yourself, are we ready to send another 100 or 200,000 or 300,000 soldiers to Iran? I'm not asking that we do nothing. We just beefed up the, the uh, sanctions a couple of months ago. But you know, there are other things to do besides saying we will always have to go to war. For example, who does Iran trade with? You know the reason why the sanctions probably won't ultimately work? because Iran trades with China and Russia and India and Japan and they're exempt from the sanctions. Or we say they have sanctions but then we give them exemptions and they sell all their oil somewhere else. We really don't have the power to shut Iran down through sanctions. If we were to convince somehow Russia and China to be on our side, we could have leverage and I think Iran would listen. The sanctions have brought them back to the table. They are negotiating. I don't for one minute believe everything they say or think that they're trustworthy, but it's better than war to have negotiations even with a fallible and perhaps a deceitful partner sometimes, but it's still better than war. I think there is such an eagerness or such a lack of reluctance in this body to think through the issues of war, and that's how we get into this. We get into it because everybody wants to be stronger than the next guy. Everybody wants to be more bellicose than the next guy. Everybody wants to say, nobody pushes us around and we're not going to take it. But there are other ways. There are other ways and we have to worry about and think about what ultimately are the repercussions. Our soldiers are not inanimate clay that we put on this master board of chess, this geopolitical chess game to move around. These are young men and women who live in your neighborhood, who live in the neighboring town. And when I think about war, when I think about this resolution, I don't think about empty black and white words on a page. I think about those young and men and women and my commitment, my real and strong commitment that I'm not going to war without absolute provocation, without a threat to the national security, and for goodness sakes, without a debate over it. Now, the other side may say, this doesn't say anything about war. No, but it says some things that really are unwise, that we would rule out an entire form of defense strategy that we used for 60 years successfully to stay out of war. So I think it's a mistake to say, 
that it's okay for Iran to be a nuclear country and we will contain them, but I think it's also a mistake to say we will never contain them. I have another amendment that's coming up this evening, and this is an amendment to place limitations on foreign aid. For the last hour or two, we've had a, a bit of the other side giving their response, and that's fine. You discover the truth by hearing the debate on both sides of this. But Senator Moynihan, who used to serve up here, and who's deceased, once said, everybody has the right to their own opinion, but you don't have the right to make up your own set of facts. So there was a senator here earlier, and he said, oh, that guy from Kentucky, he doesn't believe in a strong national defense. He would slash national defense. So anybody who's against foreign aid is not for national defense. And this particular senator said he would gut defense and he would cut it by 16%. Well, that's just sort of making up your facts, and that's not fair. He's entitled to his opinion, but he's not entitled to make up the facts. I do have a budget that I put forward that balances the budget in five years. I also have a priority within that budget that I think the most important thing that our government does and that the Constitution mandates is a strong national defense. I think it's the most important thing we do in this country. And so in my budget, I'm able to cut a significant amount of spending, but I actually eliminate the military sequester. The military sequester was an automatic cut, and I do it by cutting out other spending, real cuts in spending, in the same year to reduce the size of government, but I don't have a 16% cut in military in one year. In fact, under the military sequester, I actually restore $50 billion that allows the first year not to have any cuts in military. Now, do I think there should be some cuts in military? Yes, but I make it a little bit easier on the cuts over time. And to say I'm proposing a 16% cut is just untrue. Now, others have said, yeah, the military sequester is so horrible and he's going to cut foreign aid and the country will be defenseless and the hordes will be over here and we've got to fight them over there. There's a certain irony to this because half of these people, these senators who are caterwauling about this military sequester, guess what they won't tell you? They voted for the military sequester. I voted against the military sequester last year because I didn't think there was going to be enough cuts to really rescue us from this debt bomb that's ticking. But the people who voted for the military sequester are now up here accusing me of wanting to gut defense and all the military cuts, and they voted for the military sequester. Others have come to the floor and said, if you don't pay people to be your friend, if you don't give people military, uh, if you don't give people foreign aid, that you're wanting to withdraw from the world that you're going to withdraw into a little tiny shell, into a closet, and lock yourself in a fortress, and you're not going to engage the world. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I don't think, uh, have we, if we don't give any foreign aid to England. Have we withdrawn from England? We don't give any foreign aid to anybody in Europe. Have we withdrawn from Europe? We're incredibly connected with Europe. We're incredibly connected with China, despite our differences. Incredibly connected with China. We don't have to give foreign aid to be connected with the world. We should trade with the world. That's the connection. The more you're interconnected through trade, the less likely you are to go to war. The other side also says that if we don't have foreign aid, we'll have war. Well, my goodness, has anybody been paying attention? We've had two pretty big wars for a decade. We're involved in the longest war in the history of our country. I don't see any evidence that foreign aid is preventing war. Now, some might say, but foreign aid is humanitarian, and we want to help poor people. I see zero evidence that foreign aid is helping poor people. It's helping rich people in poor countries. I went through an hour's worth of this earlier, talking about how dictators are the ones stealing the money in Africa. Africans live on an average of $2 a day. They did 30 years ago, and they still do, because... Foreign aid doesn't get to the people. It's stolen by the dictators. The other point to make about foreign aid is they're all like, oh, my goodness, if we don't have foreign aid, we'll be fighting them on our shores. Because we have foreign aid, we have a great deal of antipathy. What they need to think through and nobody's thinking through is, why are the Arabs mad? 
Why are they yelling and screaming and burning the American flag? And it makes me mad. That's one reason I don't want to send them any money is because they're burning our flag. But why are they mad? They're mad because Mubarak, who was a dictator in Egypt, do you know what he did when the crowds would form? He hosed them down with tear gas made in Pennsylvania, bought with foreign aid. When the police came with truncheons and beat the crap out of you if you were a protester in Egypt, they did it with money from the United States. They're not mad at us because we're rich. They're not mad at us because we drive cars and have nice clothes and have music that they find distasteful. They're really not even ultimately mad at us because of that movie. They don't like it, and I understand their sensibilities on this, but that's not ultimately why they're mad. You get really mad when you're hit over the head with a police truncheon paid for with foreign aid. So it's really exactly the opposite of what the other side says. The other side says, without foreign aid, we'll have more war. I say, because of the foreign aid, we have more war. There's no objective evidence. Is there any objective evidence that we've had less war with foreign aid? None. Zero. There is a lot of evidence we're out of money, though. We are a trillion dollars in the hole every year, and they all come down, they pay lip service to it, but then they say, oh, well, $30 billion, that won't make a difference. If you don't start somewhere, you've got to start somewhere. Foreign aid's a great place to start. These senators are disconnected from the public. The public, if you talk to them, and I defy any of them that are going to vote to continue foreign aid with no limitations, go home and ask your people. I'll bet you 90% of people at home, it routinely polls in the 70s, are in favor of not sending money overseas. Particularly if you say, do you want to send money overseas to people who despise us? Do you want to send money overseas to people who are burning our flag? Do you want to send money overseas to a country that has tortured a man that helped get it bin Laden? To a country that allowed bin Laden to live within its midst for six or seven years unmolested? to a country that's mad at us now because we got bin Laden, to a country where a third of them probably would vote for bin Laden for president. So I say far from destabilizing the world, what would happen is if we were to remove foreign aid, we would remove the impetus to the Arab Spring becoming the Arab winter. What I see is people recognizing that people are angry but I see no intelligent discussion about why they're angry. When people come to me and they say, it's, oh, it's because you're rich and you're a wealthy country, that doesn't make any sense to me. Many of these people actually in the Arab Spring really do want freedom, a freedom like our freedom. Maybe a little different. I mean, it's a different culture and they believe in a, a different system of democracy than we do, but they still want some freedom. So you say, if they want freedom, we have freedom, why wouldn't they admire our system? Why wouldn't they be sympathetic? Why are they burning our flag? Why are 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people rallying and burning our flag? It's because too often our foreign aid has gone to support dictators who have oppressed their people. Mubarak got $60 billion in Egypt. His family is worth 20, 30, 40, some estimates of $50 billion. They repressed their people. You couldn't come into the street without being beaten over the head with a police baton or sprayed with tear gas made in Pennsylvania. They were mad at Mubarak, understandably so, and that anger is transferred to us. Same with Ben Ali in Tunisia. The same with Hussein. You will remember Hussein was our ally before he was our enemy. In the Iran-Iraq war, you had American planes on both sides. We had military advisors supporting Hussein against Iran, but we had F-4 Phantoms flying on Iran's side that were left in there when we left. This goes back a long way. I remember being in high school and being perplexed. Why did the Iranians hate us? Why were they burning our flag? Why were they burning our embassy and jumping up and down like a bunch of idiots, burning our flag? Why did they hate us so much? Because we kept in power a man, the Shah, who they didn't like, who they despised, and who was autocratic and had a very uh, significant police force that didn't allow dissent. So really, it's the opposite of what the other side argues for. The other side is arguing that without foreign aid, we'll have war. I'm arguing that because of foreign aid, we have war. 
because of foreign aid and because of the misapplication of foreign aid and because of the theft of foreign aid and because foreign aid is given to people who repress their people, the Arab Spring, which has a healthy element to it, has become the Arab Winter. If we don't understand that, we're never going to get beyond that. But we have to also go back to the specifics of what I'm asking for in this amendment. In this amendment, what I am asking for is that there simply be restrictions. I'm asking that to get our foreign aid, you have to act like an ally. You have to significantly and believably pledge to protect our embassy. And with Libya's regard, you have to promise to turn over the people who assassinated our, our ambassador. I think that's the minimum of what we do. Frankly, I think we probably shouldn't be sending it at all. I think this is a first step in the right direction to say, for goodness sakes, if we're going to send it to people, at least send it to people who are acting like your allies. So when you see the American flag being burned in public by tens of thousands of the horde around our embassies around the world, you ask yourself, do you want to send good money after bad to that country? Do you really believe it's working? When you do, when you think about whether your money should go to African despots and dictators, you ask, is that money getting to poor people in Africa, or is foreign aid going to rich people in poor countries? That's the history of it. It's the history of repression. It's the history of human rights abuse. It's the history of theft and more corruption than you can ever imagine. I will probably lose this vote, but I've fought long and hard. I've fought for six weeks to get this vote, and we're going to have this vote at midnight. People aren't too happy with me now. But we're going to have the vote tonight at midnight, and I think it's an important vote. I think it's an important first step whether we win or lose, because every senator who votes on this tonight will have to go home, and they will have to engage their constituents and explain to their constituents why, why they're still willing to send money to countries that are burning the American flag why they're still willing to send money to countries where there's ample evidence of corruption and theft, thievery, why they're still willing to send foreign aid to countries that are openly disdainful of us. Do you know the president of Afghanistan or senior advisors have said that if there's a war with Pakistan between the United States and Pakistan, they'll side with Pakistan? Pakistan senior advisors have said if there's a war with Iran, they'll side with Iran. These are the people we're still sending billions of dollars to, saying, please be our friends. They laugh at us. They snigger and turn away and say, fools. That's what they say to us. So I say what we need in this country is an American spring. An American spring where we wake up and say, look, to make our country great again, to retain American greatness, we have to figure out how to grow at home and I think that le means leaving more money at home. And I hope the Senate will consider this when they vote on these resolutions this evening. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Iowa. Senator from Iowa. Thank you, Mr. President. Wednesday, the Inspector General of the Department of Justice issued his report on a ATF's Operation Fast and Furious. This report is a significant milestone for the family of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry. He was killed in a firefight with illegal aliens who were armed with illegal guns for Fast and Furious. Attorney General Holder delayed any discipline for the officials responsible for Fast and Furious until after this report was released. The time for accountability has come. There are no more excuses for inaction. The Inspector General's nonpartisan review confirmed virtually everything I heard from whistleblowers over the last year and a half. The Justice Department tried to push all the blame on the ATF and officials down in Phoenix, Arizona. But the Inspector General confirmed that senior officials in Washington ignored red flag after red flag. Senior officials in both the Justice Department and ATF knew or should have known that Operation Fast and Furious 
was putting guns into the hands of criminals. But they ignored the risk and failed to take steps to protect the public safety. The Inspector General also confirmed that there were major information sharing failures between law enforcement agencies. We're still going through nearly 500 page report as well as 309 pages of new documents that the Justice Department produced late Wednesday. However, I was surprised to learn from the report that Attorney General Holder testified that he doesn't remember the conversation with me about Fast and Furious in my office January 31st, 2011. That's when I handed the first letters to the Attorney General opening up the investigation of Fast and Furious. I happen to remember that conversation. My staff told the Attorney General that day what whistleblowers had told us. Remember, whistleblowers got involved in coming to Congress because for months they were sending reports up from Phoenix to Maine Justice that selling guns illegally or encouraging our gun dealers to sell guns illegally wasn't a very smart thing for our Justice Department to do. And, that's, and when they weren't listened to, that's why these whistleblowers started coming to this senator. Specifically at that meeting with Holder, we discussed that two weapons that the ATF let go in Fast and Furious were found at the murder scene of Border Patrol Agent Terry. I emphasized that I was personally bringing it to his attention, meaning the Attorney General's attention, because these were very serious and credible allegations, not just some run-of-the-mill letter that I send to departments generally. Yet even after that meeting, the department didn't take this case seriously. The Inspector General's independent report says so explicitly, quote, we do not believe that the gravity of this allegation was met with an equally serious effort by the department to determine whether ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office had allowed the sale of hundreds of weapons to straw purchasers, end of quote. The Justice Department claimed that it, its process for writing letters to Congress was sound, but it's, fe it's February 4th 2000 letter to me, that response was false. Now that letter came back only four or five days after I first handed the letter to the Attorney General. Now, that letter was false because the DOJ later withdrew it and claimed it relied on bad information from the ATF and the U.S. Attorney's Office. However, the Inspector General agreed with me that the Justice Department's response was seriously flawed, not just the initial response. The Inspector General also found that the Justice Department knew its equally, its initial reply wasn't true when it reaffirmed the denial of the whistleblower allegations in May 2, 2000 letter to me. Instead of acknowledging that it was wrong, the department repeatedly doubled down on its denials. For example, Attorney General Holder said on multiple occasions since November 2011 that the wiretap evidence authorized by the Justice Department headquarters did not put senior leadership on notice that the ATF was walking guns. Most recently, on June the 7th of this year, the Attorney General went before the House Judiciary Committee. At this point, many members of Congress had obtained and read the affidavits, even though the Justice Department did not, did not want us to see them. Members who reviewed them said that the affidavits contained evidence of gun walking. But Attorney General Holder testified, quote, I've looked at these affidavits. Uh, I've looked at these summaries. There's nothing in those affidavits, as I've reviewed them, that indicates gun walking was allowed. 
End of quote. Well, now the Inspector General has read these same uh, wiretap affidavits. Uh, and, is, and the Inspector General, uh, since he's independent and he's nonpartisan, that independent nonpartisan conclusion is at odds with the quote I just gave you from the Attorney General. And that quote from the Attorney General comes from testimony before the other body. I quoted from this report, I quote from this report, quote, the affidavits describe specific incidents that would suggest ATF was employing a strategy of not interdicting weapons or arresting known straw purchasers, end of quote. In fact, much of the Inspector General's report is redacted because those affidavits are still under seal. Chairman Issa and I asked the Justice Department months ago to move to unseal them so that the public could decide for themselves. Now the Inspector General has joined Congressman Issa and this senator and is also calling for the department to ask for the permission of the court to release the affidavits. The Justice Department should have filed that motion months ago. Unsealing the affidavits will allow the American people and the Terry family to see the whole story. The details of those affidavits show that senior officials knew or should have known about gun walking in Fast and Furious. The Inspector General independently confirmed this point, quite contrary to the Attorney General Holder's denials. Those denials by the Attorney General show either incompetence or lack of truthfulness. Congress created an explicit statutory duty for certain senior Justice Department officials to authorize all wiretap applications, not just those involved with Fast and Furious. Deputy Assistant Attorney General Jason Weinstein, who served directly under criminal division head Lanny Brewer, was one of the officials who approved some of these affidavits. Senior officials like Mr. Weinstein tried to claim that they shouldn't be held accountable because they only read memos summarizing the wire tapes wiretaps, not the full wiretap applications, as I think is required under law. But the Inspector General found that Justice Department officials should review more than just the cover memo. He said that under the statute, they have the responsibility to be informed, fully informed, before authorizing wiretap applications. Yet the Inspector General also found that even if the, uh, quote, even a reader of the cover memorandum would infer from the facts that ATF agents did not take enforcement action to interdict the weapons or arrest straw purchasers, end of quote. So the memo that Mr. Weinstein admits he did read indicated that ATF had walked guns, according to the Inspector General. Back in September of last year, the Attorney General Holder said at a press conference, quote, the notion that somehow or other this thing reaches the upper levels of the Justice Department is something that I don't think is supported by the facts, end of quote. Now, Maybe the Attorney General doesn't think someone who reports directly to the head of the criminal division is a senior official, but this senator does. As a result of the Inspector General's findings, Deputy Assistant Attorney General Weinstein has resigned. Mr. Weinstein should be held accountable, but he shouldn't take the fall for more senior officials who are also culpable. Mr. Weinstein reported directly to Assistant Attorney General Lanny Brewer, 
when the Justice Department sent its letter to me denying ATF ever walked guns, Brewer knew otherwise. He knew in 2010 about gun walking in another case, Operation Wide Seaver. That was long before the allegations in Fast and Furious, yet he waited nine months before emails about Wide Receiver were about to be produced to Congress before he publicly apologized for not doing more about gun walking in the previous gun walking wide receiver. I asked uh, Brewer whether he had seen the draft of the February 4th false letter to me. Brewer testified, quote, I cannot say for sure whether I saw a draft of the letter that was sent to you, end of quote. Now I'm going to explain now why that was false statement that he made to me. A month after Brewer's testimony, the Justice Department released more documents showing that Brewer was sent five drafts of the letter before it was sent to me. He forwarded three of them to his personal email account. Brewer still maintained in written responses that it was highly unlikely he had, uh, and, and highly unlikely is in, in quotes, he had read the letter because he was in Mexico when it was sent. On this matter, the Inspector General report contained a significant factual error. And by the way, there aren't many errors in this uh, Inspector General's report. I compliment him for a very good job that he did. The report read about whether Brewer knew anything about this uh, letter or not, uh, quote, the, I, the OIG found no email messages from Brewer in which he proposed edits, commented on the drafts, or otherwise indicated he had read them. Now, that statement of the Inspector General is not true. In response to one of the drafts that Brewer received, he commented that to Weinstein that it was, quote, unquote, great work. That may not be a proposed edit, but it certainly is a comment. Thus, Brewer's statement to Congress is simply not credible. Emails show that Brewer was very engaged in the process, asking for and receiving updates from Weinstein at every stage of the drafting of that letter of February 4, 2011, that eight or nine months later they withdrew because it just was false. Emails show that Brewer was very engaged in the process, asking for and receiving updates from Weinstein at every stage of the drafting. Brewer and Weinstein sent multiple emails to each other on the matter each day, with Brewer asking after a quiet period, quote, Jason, let me know what's happening with this, end of quote. So quite obviously, he was involved before the letter was ever sent to me. Now, rather than holding him accountable for this evidence, the Inspector General report gives him a pass. Worse, new emails produced Wednesday show that Brewer was in the weeds about his deputy, Jason Weinstein, coming to, the, to brief judici Senate Judiciary Committee staff a week after the Justice Department's false letter was sent to me. So this is on February the 13th, 2011. Brewer sent an email about such details as what specific questions my staff asked of Weinstein at this briefing. Brewer wrote, quote, the goal, and by all accounts it seems to have worked, was to communicate that ATF's work in the Arizona case and others like it reflected sound judgment and investigative work, end of quote. It is clear that Brewer was in the weeds enough to know that the Justice Department was communicating to me 
was undermined by the gun walking he knew about in wide receiver. He should have come forward in February 2011 and told Congress that he knew ATF had, in fact, walked guns. His failure to do so, coupled with his attempt to mislead Congress, are why I have called for him to resign or be fired, and I made that request last fall on the floor of this Senate. Now Attorney General has been saying for months that he would hold off on any personnel action until the Inspector General's report was released. We've been hearing that for almost a year. Let the Inspector General finish his work and then we'll decide what to do. So, Mr. Attorney General, it's time to hold people accountable. I'd like to close with language from a statement that the family of Border Patrol Agent Brian Terry issued. And that's the person where two guns that were uh, walked were found at his murder scene. So from the family of Brian Terry, quote, the department's failures chronicled in the report had deadly and tragic consequences for hundreds of innocent American and Mexican victims of violent crime. Continuing to quote, and our son, our son, friend, relative, and hero, Brian Terry, is dead. Questions and concerns should have been raised before the weapons purchased in this failed government sting wound up in the hands of drug dealers and killers, including those who killed Brian. The focus today should not be on political spin, the Terry family says. I want, to say, I want to say that again. The focus today should not be on political spin control, nor on praise for the Department of Justice supervisors who chose to resign in light of the report's findings, but rather on the gross negligence of the department documented in the report and the tragic consequences of that negligence. End of quote. I yield the floor. President, I ask unanimous consent that Abby Duggan, Ann Berry, and Nikki Hurt of my staff be granted four privileges for the duration of today's proceedings. Without objection. Mr. President, our nation faces an absolutely fundamental choice in this year's election. Are we going to rescue, restore, and rebuild the middle class? Or are we going to continue to shift even more wealth and advantages to those at the top at the expense of the middle class? As I have done every day that we have been in session here, I want to point out to the American people just what the blueprint, the blueprint is for this country for the Romney-Ryan budget. That's their budget. The budget's a blueprint. Where you want to go, what you want to do, how you want to build something, how you want to build the future of our country. That's the Ryan budget. So I want to take a look again at the Ryan budget and what it does for the future of this country. Well, the very centerpiece, first of all, of the Ryan budget is a whopping new tax break, new tax cuts, mostly for those at the top, the richest 2 percent. Those making a million or dollars or more a year would receive $265,000 a year new tax cuts on top of the $129,000 they would get from extending the old Bush tax cuts well, that means now if you're in the top 2%, if you're making over a million dollars a year, you get $394,000 in new tax cuts. And you know, we keep hearing, Mr. President, about Mr. Romney talking and Ryan talking about entitlements, entitlements. We've got we to cut back on entitlements, don't we? Well, what about this? But that's what they always talk about. They talk about people that are lower income, that rely upon certain things like, like nutrition assistance or job training programs, uh, um, maybe Pell Grants for students, uh, uh, for poor kids to go to college, cut back on those. What about this entitlement? 
This is an entitlement. You're entitled to it. If you make over a million dollars a year, you will be entitled to those tax cuts. <laughs> but you don't hear them talking about cutting back on that entitlement. No. They want to extend it. Well, so how do they, how do they pay for all these new tax cuts? Totals $4.5 trillion over 10 years. Well, they don't exactly say how, but the Republican budget, that Ryan budget, would offset these tax cuts by making very deep and draconian cuts in programs that undergird the middle class. Everything from education, student loans, grants, law enforcement, clean air, clean water, food safety, medical research, highways, bridges, other infrastructure, all cut in the Ryan budget. And the Ryan budget, as I will explain a little bit more in detail shortly, would end Medicare. Now, you'll hear a lot of people say, well, it would end Medicare as we know it. Well, if it ends something as you know it, that means you end it. Uh, the Ryan budget, now the Romney-Ryan budget, since Mr. Romney called it marvelous, the Romney-Ryan budget would end Medicare and make it a voucher care, a voucher care system that would force seniors to pay nearly $6,000 more per year out of their pocket for health care in the future. And lastly, they offset these tax cuts by raising taxes on the middle class, actually raising taxes on the middle class. Mr. Ryan's budget is to use the deficit crisis as a pretext for dismantling Medicare, Medicaid, cutting education, environmental protection, workplace safety, and all the things I've said. What they do is they double down on the theory that if we just give more and more to those at the top, it will trickle down on everybody else. That theory was tried under President George W. Bush, and it didn't work out too well. Well, today I just want to focus more on the devastating impact of the Ryan Romney budget on Medicare and on health care generally. Since he first arrived in Congress, Representative Ryan has consistently pushed a very specific and radical health care program to end Medicare. Under his proposal, seniors would no longer have the guaranteed Medicare benefits they've enjoyed for decades. Instead, they'd get a voucher from the federal government and they can go out and buy individual private insurance or Medicare. Now, again, um, <laughs> they they say you can buy Medicare. They can stay in Medicare if you want, or you could buy private insurance. Well, let's take a look at that. In 10 years, the Ryan Pan would eliminate Medicare, shift to a vouchers, but the vouchers would not be enough to cover the health care costs. So seniors' out-of-pocket costs would go up. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office has projected that the Ryan proposal could increase annual out-of-pocket costs for seniors by more than $1,200 in 2030, almost $6,000 in 2050. And if you total up during all these years, you add one year after the other, that seniors would have to pay, well, seniors retiring in 2023 over their lifetime would pay almost $60,000 more total. Now, for seniors retiring in 2030, it would be about $125,000. When you get out to 2050, a senior retiring then would be spending over $330,000 more over their lifetime, over their retirement years, just for health care. That's what voucher care means. In addition, the Ryan plan would leave the traditional Medicare system in a death spiral. Now, Mr. Romney, Mr. Ryan, in extolling their budget, they say, well, you know, if we'll give them a voucher. And if you want to, you can go out and buy traditional Medicare or you can buy a private insurance plan. Well, what does that mean? 
That means that if you're a very healthy senior, you might get a better deal by going out and buying a private insurance plan. So who stays in Medicare? The poorest and the sickest. <laughs> and then the Medicare costs explode, and it becomes unaffordable, and you destroy the whole Medicare system. So don't buy that argument, that Mr. Ryan, that, oh, you can stay in Medicare if you want. Uh-uh. It would destroy it. It would destroy it. So make no mistake, Mr. President, the Ryan plan is a radical, radical break, a radical break with the past. This is not some little transition. This is not some little bit of experimentation or something. No, no. The Ryan budget is a radical break with what we've had in the past. It turns a successful, reliable, comprehensive source of health care that seniors have depended on for decades, paid into over years of hard work. They turn it into an unpredictable, unreliable voucher care system. Now our approach is very different. President Obama has fought to strengthen Medicare and not end it. He believes that Medicare is a sacred compact and he's proved that commitment by strengthening Medicare in the Affordable Care Act, or what we now know as Obamacare. Now, my friends on the other side of the aisle have been saying Obamacare as though it's pejorative. It's a bad connotation. I use it as a very good connotation because I want to tell you, President Obama does care. He cares about the fact that your kids can stay on a parent's policy until they're age 26. He does care that insurance companies can't put lifetime caps on real sick people any longer. President Obama does care that if you have a pre-existing condition, you can't be denied affordable health care insurance. So yes, Obama does care. And that's why I think Obamacare really does describe it well. Obama cares. Now, for example, in Obamacare, we eliminate gaps in coverage. That's the donut hole. We close the donut hole. Reduce the cost of prescription drugs. According to Medicare's actuaries, not me, the actuaries, the Affordable Care Act extends the program solvency by eight years from 2016 to 2024 by getting rid of wasteful subsidies to insurance companies, getting rid of fraud, waste, and abuse in the system. So our plan for Medicare is simple. Mend it, don't end it. And that's just what we do. The Ryan plan is bad news for those who depend on Medicare for their basic health care needs. It's disastrous. It's disastrous for people who depend on the Medicaid program. Now, the Ryan budget would block grant Medicaid, put the entire program onto the states, and then cut it by $810 billion over the next 10 years. Yes, that's right. The Medicaid, Medicaid program Block rent for the states, cut up by $810 billion over the next 10 years. So what does Medicaid do? Now, Medicare, seniors, you pay into the program, you have Medicare when you retire, or if you become disabled, if you have paid in the requisite amount of money, you can get disability coverage or survivor's benefits. I'm talking about Medicaid, health care for low-income Americans and other populations. Well, the Medicaid program is something we instituted over half a century ago now to tell all Americans that they are going to be able to have quality health care, quality health care. You remember that? debate. I remember watching one of the debates that the Republicans were having in their presidential series, and a question was asked about, well, you know, we take care of sick, pe sick people in our country, uh, and where do they go? They go to the emergency room. I mean, it costs a lot more money. But the question was asked something about, 
leave it, you just deny that? And a lot of people say, just let him die. Leave him out on the street. Is that the kind of country we want to be? That if you're sick and you don't have the wherewithal, you can't get health care? We've moved beyond that. We've moved beyond that as a society. The other population is, are, are, are Americans with disabilities. Almost one in every, in, in two Americans, almost 50% of Americans with disabilities depend on Medicaid for access to health services and supports that span everything from hospital to home care. Services from the Medicaid program allow our citizens with disabilities to live with dignity and with a purpose in their homes and in their communities. Nearly three million seniors and people with disabilities use the Medicaid program to avoid costly nursing home care. So if you cut home and community-based care for this group of Americans, then they would have to turn to institutional care. So the short-term cuts, these cuts that they're going to make in Medicaid, will lead to longer-term expenses because we know that institutional care is more expensive than care at home or in the community. Well, I guess unless you just say to them, well, tough luck, you're on your own. Tough luck. You got a disability? Cut your Medicaid, can't live at home, go live in an institution. Oh, the institution's no longer there because we can't afford it? Well, then I guess you got to go out on the street and beg. Is that what we want to see? Like many third world countries where you see people with disabilities on the corners begging? Families with a child with a disability out in the street begging? Is that what we want to do? You want to walk down the street? And see people who, through no fault of their own, are disabled, and they're out there begging with a tin cup and a tin plate? Is that the kind of country we want to become? To dismantle the Medicaid program, as they would do under the Ryan budget, would dismantle our commitment to quality, affordable health care for all. The Medicaid program is a lifeline to hundreds of thousands of middle-class families. Yes, middle-class families, working families, who have children with lifelong disabilities like Down syndrome or autism. Instead of cutting these families off from a critical lifeline, we should be strengthening the long-term viability of this program, Medicaid, reassuring these families that America is not going to turn its back on them when they need help the most. And you know, you don't have to take my word for it about shredding this compact. I've said many times that we have a unique American social contract, contract, compact, that evolved, evolved over our march from a society in which we had child labor, which if you were older and poor, you went to the county home, where children died in infancy, where if you were disabled, you were put in dark places. So we evolved a social contract. We said basically in America, we're going to provide a ladder of opportunity or ramp of opportunity. We're, we're going to make sure that we take care, that we educate our young and take care of our elderly, our social safety net. Here's the former Reagan economic advisor, Mr. Bruce Bartlett, former Reagan economic advisor. Here's what he said. Distributionally, the Ryan plan is a monstrosity, monstrosity. The rich would receive huge tax cuts, while the social safety net would be shredded to pay for them. Shredded to pay for them. And again, you don't 
even have to take those words. I think, I think the bishops had something to say about that when the bishops said the Ryan budget fails the moral test. The nation's Catholic bishops reiterated their demand that the federal budget protect the poor and said the GOP measure fails to meet these moral criteria. The Ryan budget. The Ryan budget. Well, Mr. President, a centerpiece of the Ryan budget, again, is his promise to repeal the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. They want to repeal that. Well, again, once you get past this political theater and look at what repeal of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare would actually mean, not a very pretty picture. Repeal would reopen the Medicare prescription donut hole, the drug donut hole requiring seniors to pay about $600 more per year on average for prescription drugs. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, about 86 million Americans received at least one free preventative service in 2011, and almost one million Iowans received at least one free preventative service in 2011. That would be repealed. That would be repealed. Then they would be charged. And now, Americans now get services like mammograms, colonoscopies, other cancer screenings. As I said, more than 85 million, 86 million Americans receive free preventative services. This is in keeping with Obamacare's goal to change us from a sick care society to a health care society. Rather than focusing all of our attention and money on emergency room care or on when people get the sickest, we start to move it more up front to preventative care, getting people early, preventing illness, keeping people healthy and out of the hospital in the first place. The Ryan budget shreds all that. Back to the old system we've always had. No preventative care. When you get sick, you go to the hospital, go to the emergency room. That's busting us as a country. It's breaking our budget. We've got to put more into prevention. Yes, Mr. President, your mother was right. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I don't know why we haven't learned that. Well, we did learn it. We put that in Obamacare. Now the Ryan budget says, no, we want to get rid of that. Repeal of Obamacare would allow insurance companies to deny people coverage because of a pre-existing condition. Nearly half of Americans have some form of a pre-existing health condition. And the Affordable Care Act right now covers all children. And in 2014, just one year and three months from now, actually a little over two months from now, everyone, everyone will be covered even if they have a pre-existing condition. This is Eleanor Pierce from Cedar Falls, Iowa. Denied health insurance when she lost her job because of her pre-existing condition of high blood pressure. Without coverage, she racked up $60,000 in medical debts. So, you repeal Obamacare, more than 30 million people would be denied access to affordable and comprehensive health insurance would make insured Americans pay more than tens of billions of dollars of uncompensated care when they show up in emergency rooms. And actually, repealing Obamacare would cost American families an average over $1,100 in extra premiums annually that we're paying right now for uncompensated care when people show up in the emergency room. Repeal would kick more than three million young people off their parents' policy. Now that hurt people like Emily Slichting. She testified at one of our hearings, a young woman in Omaha. She said, young people are the future of this country and we are the most affected by reform. We're the generation that is most uninsured. We need the Affordable Care Act because it is literally an investment in the future of this country. Well, she suffers from a rare autoimmune disorder that in the bad old days, made her uninsurable. 
Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, she's now covered under her parents' policy until she's age 26. And guess what? She'll be there next year in 2014, and then her pre-existing condition will mean nothing. She'll be able to get affordable health insurance. The Ryan budget says, sorry, Emily, <laughs> sorry, you're on your own. You're just on your own. Well, these are just a few of the ways in which the Ryan plan to repeal Obamacare would drag us backwards, backwards, to the bad old days when insurance companies were in the driver's seat. Millions of Americans were one illness away from bankruptcy. Now, over the last few weeks, Governor Romney and Representative Ryan have been saying that the president's health reform robs Medicare, robs it. I, I heard that he said that in Florida last night. Mr. President, I don't know how else to say this, but that's just totally false. That's untrue. First, nonpartisan economists have certified that the president's health care plan, Obamacare, has strengthened the Medicare program, extends its solvency by eight years. <laughs> if we were robbing the Medicare program, how could it extend its solvency by eight more years? The Affordable Care Act doesn't rob Medicare. It makes the program more efficient, more reliable. It saves $700 billion, not from beneficiaries, not from recipients who are on Medicare, but from overpayments to private insurance companies, providers, pharmaceuticals, cracking down on fraud, waste, and abuse. And now, what's really interesting is that uh, the Ryan budget has exactly the same savings in his budget as Obamacare has in his plan, in the plan that we passed here. Same, exact, to the dollar, written the same way. As President Clinton said, you know, you've got to give him one thing. It takes some brass to attack a guy for doing what you did. Ryan put in his budget exactly what we had in Obamacare, and now they're attacking President Obama for what they have in their budget. Go figure. Go figure. In both of his budget proposal, Mr. Ryan keeps all of the Affordable Care Act's Medicare improvements that we put in the Affordable Care Act. But I just heard Mr. Romney last night in Florida attacking President Obama for doing what Mr. Romney said was marvelous <laughs> about Mr. Ryan's budget. In short, Mr. President, Mr. Ryan's Medicare plan would end Medicare. And this, is there's something else that I hear them say all the time. They say that, that they're going to protect everyone over age 55. Under the Ryan plan, he says, well, they're, they're going to go to this voucher care, but anyone over age 55, they're protected. I've got to ask, protected from what? I mean, if it's such a good deal... Why don't we do it for everybody? Yet, Mr. Ryan and Mr. Romney say, no, no, they're going to, the, everyone over age 55 stays. They all have the same Medicare system. They don't get voucher care. It's only under age 55. Well, there must be something wrong with it then. If it's so darn good, why don't you put everybody in there right away? Or, conversely, if you're protecting everyone over age 55, why don't you protect everyone under age 55? <laughs> Got it? If you're age 55 and under, you're unprotected. You're voucher care. That's the dirty little secret they're not telling you. Well, again, by repealing, by repealing the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, 439,000 Iowa seniors be forced into these vouchers. 60,000 Iowa seniors would be forced back into the donut hole, paying more money for their drugs. And 400,000 Iowa seniors would pay for preventative services 
that they now get at no cost. More than 30 million people, more than 30 million people would be denied coverage under the Ryan budget. Obamacare ensures more than 94 percent of all Americans, and that's what would happen. They would be denied coverage. Well, the bottom line, Mr. President, and I'll close with this, President Obama, Obamacare protects Medicare, keeps it solvent, keeps everyone covered. The Ryan budget shreds the social safety net for Medicaid and destroys Medicare by turning it into a voucher system. Obamacare protects Americans from insurance company abuses, expands coverage, increases the quality of care, shifts more into prevention and keeping people healthy. The Ryan budget does away with all that and drag us backward to the bad old days. Mr. President, when you look at the Ryan budget, the Romney-Ryan budget, since Mr. Romney called it marvelous, when you look at that, you just got to shake your head in disbelief that they really would take America back that far after we've come so far in covering people, getting rid of pre-existing condition clauses, taking off caps on lifetime, lifetime coverage if you have a serious illness so you don't go bankrupt, making sure kids can stand on their parents' policies. We don't want to go back, Mr. President. And that's why, that's why this Ryan budget must be totally defeated. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor. Mr. President, <clears throat> the Senator from Vermont. I want to congratulate my uh, colleague, uh, Senator Hawkins, for